think I wanted to go first. Okay. <laughs> it's nice to be back here at UMass. I only wish it could be under different circumstances. But I think this event is a wonderful tribute, and I thank Michael and everybody for putting it on. Um, to, a tribute to an outstanding scholar, mentor, and teacher. I hope, you know, I think today should be a celebration of his work, his life, his family, and friends, and his students. So, yeah, I'm currently the president of ASA. You know, one of Steve's, along with Rick Wolf's, and their very activist graduate students, many accomplishments. We're about 30 years old now, I see here, and I'm proud to say we have over 100, 100 active members all over the world. Moreover, as our next speaker, Jack Emeriglio, would tell you, uh, another accomplishment we have, or they have had, is sponsoring Rethinking Marxism, which is now celebrating its 25th year. This journal, which started only out as a dream of Steve, Rick, and the grad their graduate students, is now ranked 20th in heterodox journals, economics journals, that is, as well in the top third. This September, we, ASA and RM, will be hosting the 8th Gala Conference entitled Surplus, Solidarity, and, Su and Sufficiency, right here at UMass. Indeed, every gala so far has been held here. I guess it's just because it's our home. The conference will not only celebrate 25 years of the journal, but we also honor Steve and his good friend and colleague, Julie Graham. The longevity of ASA and RM wouldn't have been possible without the leadership, mentoring, and teachings of both Steve Resnick and Rick Wolf. I know this is supposed to be a tribute to Steve's life and work, which of course it is, but one cannot talk about Steve without including Rick. Their 40-year collaboration was astonishing to say the least. And now, even though we've unfortunately lost Steve, his legacy continues via Rick, his students, <coughs> colleagues, friends, and family. Perhaps uh, you've noticed some folks who would have absolutely been here are not. Indeed, they wanted to, but alas, they continued with their scheduled RM editorial board meeting that's going to be in DC tomorrow, so they couldn't make it. I think this is only fitting, though, that the e-board made this decision, because that's what Steve was about, and this, his important work, this important work, should continue to grow, and indeed it is. We now have multi-generational students of Rick, uh, Steve and Rick, who are teaching at institutions worldwide. At John Jay College, which is part of the City University of New York, which City College was too, is too, excuse me. Um, this, as of this fall, we will have six economists, three who are ASA members, and four are UMass Econ economics graduate students, mm -hmm. were economics graduate students. Not only that, we also have a UMass economics alum in Africana Studies. So I guess it's our time to offer a crit critique to neo the neoliberal agenda so prominent in the news. By the way, as I said, John Jay is part of the City University of New York, um, where Steve um, also taught before coming to UMass. So I guess we've kind of come full circle. To me, Steve was a very hands-off type of teacher. And by that way, I say, and I, by that, and I say that, a teacher, because Steve taught. He didn't just profess. He mm. taught us. Um, he gave us room to cre be creative and flourish, as Zoe pointed out. He also offered, sometimes insisted, guidance when he thought appropriate. I was fortunate enough to know him, work with Steve, but alas, only for about 20 years, not like many of the people in this room. Um, when I when we spoke to Steve, his dry Boston humor made me laugh, but occasionally I did cry. That said, I left every meeting not only feeling welcome, but I always came out thinking. Okay, I'm going to go on a lighter note. The first time I heard Steve speak, I giggled. I thought he talked funny. Um, 
I found out he was a staunch Red Sox fan. OMG, I, not something a New Yorker, well, actually a Jersey girl, wanted to find out, especially one that's a Mets fan and a Yankees fan. And even though, and, and even though this was under unfortunate circumstances last week, I only wish Steve could have seen all those Yankee fans in the Bronx belting out Sweet Car Caroline during the game. I love Steve's dry sense of humor and emanated in every class and conversation I had with him. But one particular instance I'll share with you all today. <clears throat> this one really stands out for me and I chose to end this small tribute to such a great man with this memory. As Jerry said, I defended my dissertation in February of 2006. I started in 94. Okay. <laughs> okay. At that time, I was teaching at Indiana University in the Labor Studies Department. The previous May, I was told if I didn't defend my dissertation within the year, I would be canned. So I put, so put myself to work and finally wrote the dang thing. I was going to use another word there, but I chose not to. Okay, with that, with that, with the many graduate students that Rick and Steve advised, the turnaround time for the for, for the draft was a bit longer than I expected. But when I got their comments back, Steve and I had well over 30 emails within the next three days, ending on New Year's Eve. I then promised I would send all revisions within two weeks, and I did. Steve and Rick, amazingly, got back to me within three days. Now that's amazing. Amazing turnaround time, given the no many, many students the two of them advised. They told me to get a defense date. Okay, so now we're jumping forward to that defense date, February 27th, 2006. I flew home to New Jersey from Indiana and to then talked my mother into coming with me to Amherst to witness my defense. Mm -hmm. Note, well, I'm a first generation college grad as well, working class, so um, my mom had no idea what this was all about, never mind Marxian economics. <laughs> <laughs> she sat there, at the, sat attentively during the whole thing. At one point in the defense, I looked at her and, I, and thought, Oh my God, she looks like a deer with a headlight shining into her eyes. My committee, Rick, Steve, and Elaine Bernard, discussed my thesis, asked me questions, normal for any PhD defense, not, however, for those who aren't academics. Then the committee asked if anyone in the audience had any questions. Steve looked right at my mother. Scared, she just shook her head, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I, how I felt guilty for bringing her. Then the committee asked us all to leave the room. Within a few minutes, I was asked to come back in. This, quite frankly, could have been taken a few ways. Uh, but I went back in by myself. Rick and Elaine congratulated me. But Steve, he had something different to say. He said, and I'm... I'm trying to quote, but it's a little paraphrasing. I didn't dare pass you. Did, I didn't dare not pass you. I was afraid of you, New Jersey mother. <laughs> <laughs> now, last night, Suzanne, my friend and colleague, and I tried to work on my Boston accent. It isn't going to happen. You can't take this girl out of Jersey, I guess. I don't know. So we will always miss Steve, but his work, his legacy, will live on for a very, very long time. Uh, not only through his students and Rick, but through his family, and particularly his grandchildren that I know he loves so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>